Our actions are our future. Everyone has beautiful faces, but we will make it work. Um, yes. So this panel discussion, again, thank you everyone for joining me and thank you to our viewers and listeners for tuning in today for this discussion on world, about World Food Day. Uh, with me, I have a few young experts in their field. I'm going to let them say a little bit about themselves, but we also have with us, uh, I would like to say the star of the show, uh, our very own Oprah, if you will. Uh, Dr. Renata Clark. She is FAO's sub-regional coordinator for the Caribbean. So the goal for today is to basically have a short but meaningful conversation about agri-food systems, food, diet, health, everything to do with the Caribbean in a Caribbean context, and basically to just pose questions, share knowledge, uh, exchange ideas, and have the young people ask questions that are relevant to them and to me, to all of us, but particularly for young people because it is our future at risk and it is our future that matters. And right now we are the ones that are supposed to hold everyone accountable. So this conversation is going to be fun. It's going to be informative and I am very much looking forward to it. So at this point, um, I'm going to just let Dr. Renata Clark say a few words and then we will move on to our panelists and introduce them and then we will get the ball rolling. So Dr. Clark, uh, it's over to you. Well, there's nothing much to say. I am the sub-regional coordinator for FAO for the Caribbean that covers the 13 English speaking countries of the Caribbean. I'm very, I like engaging with young people, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. We have limited time today, but I'll say from now, if there's something that you think you would like to follow up on, please just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to carry on this conversation in any other forum. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so at this point, we will move on to our lovely panelists. I am fortunate enough to know each and every one of them. So we have three panelists with us today and we will start with ladies first. So in all, I just want you to give a short who you are, what field you work in, what interest you have in World Food Day, something short and snappy. So let's start with ladies first, uh, Victoria, Victoria Cox. Just give us a little introduction about who you are and World Food Day and Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me here. My name is Victoria Cox, and as Megan said, well, I am a registered dietitian, so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm a clinical dietitian. I work in private practice, and as well for the Barbados Diabetes Foundation, also called the Maria Holder Diabetes Center. So I am interested in World Food Day because I talk about food all day long. <laughs> I eat, sleep, and breathe food. Um, and so it will be really interesting to have this conversation for more of um, like a food systems and agriculture lens, because typically I'm talking to people about their very specific personal food needs as it relates to their health. And obviously food insecurity on sort of a one on one level comes up all the time because I can't suggest that someone eat healthily if they can not access healthy food. So it will sort of be just interesting to have this conversation on sort of a, a bigger scale, because like I said, I'm talking food. If I'm talking health and nutrition, it means I'm talking food because we eat food, not individual nutrients, right? So that's kind of my uh, take on this this morning. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, earlier, I was talking about her amazing recipes that she introduced me to. So she knows her stuff when it comes to food. <laughs> that being said, we're going to move on now to uh, Christopher Laurie. Uh, Chris, just introduce yourself, who you are, tell us a little bit about World Food Day from your perspective and floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks for the um, invitation, Megan, and thanks to FAO for hosting this um, session. Um, so my name is Christopher Laurie. I'm coming to you from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados. I work currently with a special projects team, and we are focused on childhood obesity prevention. And within this space, we talk a lot about nutrition policies, specifically um, those that help to regulate and enhance a healthy school environment. So this conversation is very topical, very relevant. Um, one of the things that we are concerned about as well, of course, is um, when you talk about healthy foods, you have to talk about those levels of food sustainability that uh, Victoria alluded to, 
um, because you don't want to go around preaching a gospel about things that people can't access. Um, so the agricultural sector is super important and I'm very happy to engage in this space today. Thank you so much. So at this point, Pierre, go right ahead. Thank you, Megan. So uh, my name is Pierre Cook. I'm the technical advisor to the Healthy Caribbean Coalition. Um, I'm also the president of the University of the West Indies Law Society um, and prime minister of Margaret National Youth Parliament. And it sounds strange for me to be involved in a food conversation in a world food space, but necessarily one of my advocacy areas is talking about the health and rights of persons to health. And we all know that food has a major uh, implication on the um, health outcomes of persons and that conversations around access to food. Um, I'm, I'm researching a new space of trade conversations in relation to food and then how the law impacts the foods that we have access to and how that in turn impacts our health. So it's really um, a, a great space to pull everything together and just have a single uh, conversation about what needs to be done to protect the rights of persons to good food and good health. Thank you so much. When uh, Markita asked me to basically corral some young people, I'm not going to lie, you three were the first three that I thought of because you, you all come from different backgrounds, you all have a different perspective, and it's always sometimes a bit of a problem when you have the same ideas being perpetuated in these spaces. So I like the fact that everyone has something a little bit different to offer. So that being said, what is going to happen is we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Clark and you guys are actually going to be in the driver's seat for this. I know you had some questions to pose to Dr. Clark. So I'm in the facilitating role in terms of controlling the conversation. So just so that we are aware, if I think that there is a conversation that while extremely interesting has been prolonged a little bit too long, just so that we can touch on other ideas, I'll just uh, indicate via a thumbs up um, that we will be proceeding to another topic of conversation. So if you see my thumbs up, that means that, okay, it's time to wrap up the point and then hopefully we can move on to something else so that everyone has a chance to have uh, an equal opportunity to talk to Dr. Clark. So with that being said, I kind of a traditionalist, so I will start with ladies first again. Um, I know that Victoria has some questions for her. So Victoria, why don't you just start with one of your questions that you have and we'll see how the conversation goes from there. By the way, it's not a Q&A extremely informal so anyone that has a point by all means let's have a back and forth I know Dr. Clark values enriching conversations so don't be shy don't be hesitant just let's talk like we're having a conversation so Victoria take it away all right thank you so when I was thinking about questions for this and like I said my perspective is um maybe a little bit different it's not on sort of a policy level it's just talking one-on-one -on -one with people about food um and I, when I was specifically thinking about today's youth, I, something that comes up a lot for me is, I guess, what's presented as healthy on social media, on Instagram, you know, food that looks real aesthetically pleasing and it looks really healthy and everybody's talking about how it is, you know, it's non-GMO, it's organic, it's local, it's, it's all of these wonderful things. Um, but then sometimes that sort of almost perfect image of healthy eating um, overwhelms people when they feel like they can't access the more kind of um, the, the the organic produce or certain things. So I was just, I guess, wondering how do we engage young people and sort of bring more, um, I guess, transparency in terms of, I guess, conventional agriculture and farming and not everything. You can still get a lot of nutrition, a lot of benefits from um, conventionally farmed food as if, if not necessarily organic produce or non-GMO produce because um, I'll, I'll almost sort of see people think where if they can't get what they consider to be the gold standard of healthy eating they just don't really bother trying to get produce at all necessarily um, because it seems so unattainable so just I guess my questions were around like engaging young people and sort of having youth leaders in terms of showing, oh, this is what healthy eating can also look like. And that sort of spun to my question about encouraging people to eat ugly fruits and veggies, um, you know, which I think is a fun concept that I'd started to hear about when I was living overseas. So sort of a jumbled, uh, not very concise question, but <laughs> there you go. It was an interesting question. 
let me go to the first bit about you know what people understand as being healthy or, or your even your point about how can you bring more transparency because uh, I think this is an important concept particularly you know in in a country that imports 80 percent of its food you know what's happened to this food before it gets to me I mean there are a few things that are as intimate as 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 our we are with our food. I mean, these are things we put inside of us. So we are very concerned. It's important from a point of view of, okay, when we speak of organic, for instance, and for sure, FAO is a big proponent of integrated pest management. In other words, reducing chemical inputs, using a mixture of, 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 of approaches to make sure that your crops can grow well, but reducing the need for agricultural chemicals. They will be necessary, but keep them as low as possible. And organic, even more so. The main benefits there are environmental. You know, the chemicals that enter our, our, our soils, our water systems. And so clearly there's a huge environmental advantage. There's a huge, there's a huge workers' health advantage in terms of spraying of pesticides. But in terms of the risk of pesticide residues, it's interesting. I mean, I've seen surveys from all over the world. Generally, consumers rank this as a high priority. In reality, when you look at the data and what is actually causing harm, pesticide residues are very low on that list of things. They are microbiological pathogens, viruses and bacteria. They are mycotoxins from, you know, that we have evidence that these are the things that consumers should be more concerned about. But all over the world, you know, there's this, 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 in our collective imaginary, we think that pesticides are the biggest problem in relation to food safety, which is not borne out by the evidence. So, you know, perhaps, and we talk about transparency and discussion, you know, we do need to have more conversations about what, what are the real risks, you know, what should consumers really be concerned about? I, I should make one aside, a proviso in relation to the pesticide, that pesticide residues are not generally not a serious food safety issue once they are used well. So if, you know, if you have farmers who are, are not trained or dealing with a pest issue that they really haven't got guidance on, so they're putting the wrong uh, the wrong pesticides or in the case of the Caribbean we always hear about previous larceny you know when someone steals fruit or vegetables they don't know when the last pesticide application was so that the the time has not been respected so I'm not saying it could never be a problem but good agricultural practice with traditional agriculture it is much less of a problem than people think I can speak to you about your ugly veg of your ugly veggies. And of course, the notion there is, you know, along the same lines, don't, you know, don't drive for, you know, that you can't have a single insect damage or, or some misshapen, which tends to drive two things, chemical use, but also waste. And I'm going to come back to the issue of, of waste, hopefully in our in our conversation, because that's an interesting thing. So, you know, I, I, I think those um, campaigns on ugly veggies, I think they're very, very constructive. And I think all people need is information. You know, if people are aware on, on what is the impact of waste and, and how, you know, the environmental benefit of not using loads of pesticides, I think we can all, we can all benefit. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, that's... A I, I really love what you said in terms of, you know, the transparency as far as what the evidence says versus kind of what we or the people tend to perceive as what we should be concerned about versus, you know, what the evidence maybe says we can be concerned about, as well as just going into the benefits, like you said, of reduction of, of pesticide use and what that looks like. Um, yes, because it's just so interesting for me to see, like I said, on a one on one basis, and I'll be quick and brief, but like, you know, I've had people who are so hyper focused on the possibility of pesticides on their say vegetables, but on a daily basis, they're consuming lots of like canned processed meats. And it's sort of like, there's a, 
there's a break there in, I guess, the thought process, you know what I mean? So being able to bring some light, talk about what the evidence says and the thought process behind everything would be um, super valuable. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I must echo Victoria's sentiments about what we focus on versus what actually might be more harmful. So I, I took a note of that because you're right. I do think pesticides first, but you're saying that there actually might be some things that we need to consider that we have not been considering in terms of what is and is not harmful. Um, before I move on to uh, Chris, I just want to know if any, either Chris or Pierre had a point to add. Uh, no pressure, obviously, but just open it up to you guys before I move on to Chris to ask his question. If, yeah, so if no one, Chris, go ahead. Now I'll let Pierre okay. go because I'll, I'll make my comment and then pose my answer, my next question as well. No problem. Yeah, no, I was, I was saying again why these types of conversations are important because a dimension I never really considered was, you know, those ugly vegetables and just how much that can lead to waste and, and increased use of certain chemicals in order to present to customers something that they find appealing. Um, and I think it's important for persons like myself and other advocates or persons involved in the space to engage more conversations around, you know, having um, access to foods, but also understanding that, you know, all food um, isn't good food, but necessarily when you look at your produce and what you're picking, um, we need to have serious conversation about what that food should look like and how our thoughts and ideas behind what vegetables should look like um, can contribute to food wastage. And, and I know that's a serious global conversation as well. So that, that dimension of the conversation is very important to highlight as an outcome from, from today's chat. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I used to be guilty of tossing a fruit if it, don't look, if it had like a little bit of a mark even though it's perfectly fine, I could just cut it out. I would toss it or I would just discard, not even look at it if I was in the supermarket. So I've had to train myself to accept that fruit isn't supposed to be perfect. If we as humans are not perfect, why do we expect our fruit to be perfect? So I do take more notice of that. Um, that being said, Chris, I know that you have a question, so go right ahead. Can I just say something about food waste? Because th this, is, uh, this is an important issue. I don't know how many of you are aware that the SDG 12 actually includes an indicator on the reduction of waste. And the target is that countries should be reducing waste by 50% by 2030. And by definition, what they consider as waste as separate from food loss they consider food waste to be what is lost at the stage of retail or the consumer. And right now that's at around, it's estimated to be around 17%. And when you think that the agricultural system accounts for about 30% of the greenhouse gas production, and you think of the natural resources that go into producing food, the thought that you just waste 17% of it is, you know, completely unforgivable. So we certainly all have to take that, those steps to, to reduce waste. And eating ugly vegetables is certainly <laughs> an important first step. Yes, for sure. Uh, thanks so much for that, Dr. Clark. Uh, Chris, I'm going to let you go ahead. I'm keeping an eye on the time, so... No worries. Thanks, Megan. And thank you, Dr. Clark, for that clarification. That was one of my concerns as well um, on the topic of food loss and food wastage, um, particularly um, with local produce, because we tend to think, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, so once it's marked as a local product, we think that it's inferior and we tend to shy away from it, which is mind boggling to me uh, when those are the most nutritionally dense and healthy for you. And those are what you want to eat locally and seasonally. And on that note, um, shifting the stigma um, away from the food product itself a little to the, the process of agriculture and farming, I was curious um, to get your views on how do we encourage young persons to step into agriculture? Because we know that traditionally agriculture, unfortunately, does have a colonial Past, a colonial legacy. And people think that if you step into agriculture or farming, it's because you didn't perform well in school, you weren't able to become a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and there is money to be made um, in economies of scale. 
um, more than what <laughs> these um, traditional professions are making. Um, so how do we get more Barbadians, more Caribbean um, young persons to become involved in this industry? Thank you, Christopher, for a, a thought-provoking question. It's a conversation that I've had from time to time with Megan as well. And, you know, we hear a lot about people saying, oh, you need to make agriculture sexy. And I resist that notion, you know, my conversation with, with, with Megan and other young people with whom I've had this discussion is, no, we, we do need to make people understand that there is a future and there is satisfaction that you can earn a much more than decent living from agriculture. You know, it, so yes, you know, we have this image of working in, 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 in the yard, you know, hoeing and getting sweaty and, and being poor. And yet there are very few people who make the option of, I choose to work very hard, but never have any money. So the issue is how do we, how do we demonstrate that agriculture can be viable not just economically, although remuneration is important, but also from that perspective of satisfaction. I know I'm making a contribution. I am able to use my imagination to do things differently than they were before. And believe me, that is precisely what we need to do. There's a lot of talk about transforming agriculture. You don't transform agriculture by keeping doing the same things. You transform agriculture by approaching problems differently, by leveraging technology. So when I get into those conversations with people saying, oh, young people like digital, if you make it sexy for them, they'll go. And, you know, for me, they've got it the wrong way around. We need to, first of all, analyze the situation and understand where the opportunities lie. I mean, Barbados is never going to be the breadbasket of the world, but we can do a whole lot better than we have been doing. Where do the opportunities lie? Make sure that the business case is clear, that young people do see a future. The innovation that I'm talking about is going to be part of it. You know, we don't have economies of scale. So we do need to choose how we do things to really optimize the outcomes. And uh, this is an area where FAO is, is, is trying to use its you know, global networks to help leverage technology. So it's about using the technology to improve productivity and competitivity. It's not about let's make agriculture look sexy so young people will join. I, I mean, I, th there is a point of convergence, but, but there are two different thought processes behind. So we and the supporting institutions need to make that case for agriculture. We need to facilitate innovation. We need to facilitate access to finance. There are several UN agencies now that are also looking at innovative financing mechanisms to make sure that young people can, with good ideas, can access finance. Okay, so there's a lot to do, but what we need more, more than anything is energy and vision. So, and we're looking to the youth for that. We have failed. <laughs> we haven't done it right. There's. Now we have to throw our energy behind you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Um, you said that we need to identify the areas that are basically areas of opportunity. And not to put you on the spot, but for any young person listening who is curious but doesn't know where to start, could you off the top of your head think of any of these areas of opportunities that you see in Barbadian context or even the regional context that you see young people could possibly turn their eye to, but they might not know about? Now, I hate to give you a boring answer, <laughs> but the okay. answer is that we are trying to, to walk the talk. In other words, not just jumping in and doing anything, but we're spending a lot more time analyzing value chains, really making that argument for this is where we see opportunities and market potential. And we're doing that in several countries. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a slow process. And we're, we are doing this in Barbados as well. So I, I think more than telling people what value chains show promise, I'd like people to tune in to a different way of thinking. In other words, agriculture isn't getting a piece of land and getting whatever 
seeds or plantlets you have and hoping for the best. It is an exercise that is more cerebral. I think Christopher referred to, oh, you know, it's the dumb people that have no options that do this. No, it is the people who can imagine and think laterally and find ways to get the most out of, you know, our limited natural resource base. And it is, and one of the things that I, I did want to say when speaking about getting youth in agriculture, if we can get things right, youth in agriculture is not just the guy, you know, planting or harvesting or even processing, but can we get the technologies around agriculture? Because if we are innovating, they're all of those spin-offs. The people who are creating the technologies, the people who are maintaining the technologies. You know, I wouldn't say that everything is possible, but a whole lot more is possible than what we've been doing now. Thank you so much for that, because what you're basically saying is counter to what the stereotype is. You actually require creativity. You, re you require some innovation. You require you can't be a dumb person, so to speak. You need to have something up there to, to how do you make so much out of so little. That requires a, a talent, a skill, insight that not everybody possesses and creativity. So before I move on to Pierre for his question, I just wanted to know if anyone had uh, something to add to the conversation currently. Uh, Victoria, Chris, Pierre himself, anyone. If not, we can just move on to Pierre's question. I think I just, I mean, I think I just agree, sorry, with the, that idea that um, it has that, that stereotype as opposed to the fact that it requires so much innovation and creativity and business um, insight as well. You know, it's, it is a, it's a business. And um, I just wish that even like our schooling system incorporated more of that, say, in, in business classes and, and things like that. Because I do feel like we have this very sort of stereotypical, are you going to go into medicine? Are you going to go into law? Are you going to, you know, kind of mindset from the time we're quite young. Um, and I just think it would be great to, you know, showcase that um, there are other opportunities and agriculture is, is an impressive one with a lot of, um, that requires a lot of insight, yeah. Chris or Pierre, anything or? Um, yes, I would love to echo uh, Victoria's sentiments uh, with regard to a reimagination of what the school curriculum looks like and what we push and promote. Um, I mean, I, I met Victoria through after school lessons in chemistry and biology, and she went into dietetics, I went into medicine, and I ultimately tapped to health research. But neither of us, I'm sure, had ever thought about how do we translate this information and this know how into an agricultural lens. And I think that is so unfortunate because it is obviously um, a career pathway. And I, and I specifically emphasize career and not just a hobby, it's not an after school project, it's not a backyard garden. You can make money from this, you can be productive, you can be a valuable member of society and it's not, it doesn't have to be a stigmatized area. So I think that the more that we can reach people at a younger age, and I'm so glad that FAO is engaging youth on this topic specifically, um, and hopefully you know, younger and younger ages and stages even, that we can start to push this narrative um, and encourage persons to reevaluate what it means to go into um, sustainable farming, um, you know, building uh, climate resilient uh, resources, all of these kind of things. It, it is a very technically um, sound area and it does require that level of creativity. So um, definitely push on the education. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, with that lovely point made, I'm going to go over to Pierre so that he can ask his question. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to comment very quickly on the points made earlier. Um, and, and again, I think in the same way that Chris and Victoria has experienced that, my experience of the education system has been um, persons who pursue uh, agriculture and, and farming in that area, um, you see it as a throwaway subject or something that necessarily you just do because it's a passion and not to make any money or, or um, to do as a profession. And even then those persons are seen as less than academically than other persons. Um, but I too, do think more and more with these conversations, we will find more young persons being engaged and interested in the space. Um, but what I would like to see more of is uh, a more concrete commitment to supporting youth in these ventures. As much as it takes creativity and skill to think about how to make it 
sexy or how to make it fun or how to make it lucrative, um, there needs to be financial commitments to supporting young people in these areas. Um, and oftentimes we have the conversations around, you know, youth need to get involved in this space and youth need to help with climate resilience and youth need to help with um, pushing the, the food agenda. Um, but then we see a lack of the stronger commitments that is needed to see those projects actually be put in place. Um, so that type of commitment is what is needed going forward. Those concrete um, internship commitments, financial commitments to support the ideas and initiatives of youth um, so that we can move from a place of ideation into implementation and actual change in our food systems. Um, and as the, the, the law student on the panel, I think my question shifts us to a more technical space where um, uh, we, we had, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, that we import in Barbados at least about 80% of our food. Um, and my question would be, what kind of food import regulations uh, do we need um, not only in Barbados, but maybe across the region to strengthen our food systems in order to ensure that the best products are available to the Caribbean people. Um, so whether that's a conversation about around front of package warning labels, um, a conversation around what types of food we accept and where we accept them from, um, and what standard or quality we expect them to be, what are those food import regulations that are needed or need to be strengthened to ensure the best food is available to our people? Okay, Pierre. Now, <laughs> law student Pierre. For sure, regulation and import regulations are important, and, and that there are all kinds of regulations, and you've mentioned some of them. For example, regulations, labeling requirements, you know, requiring that, uh, that manufacturers provide information about, about nutrition and health. And I know that that discussion is going on vigorously and, uh, and Healthy Caribbean Coalition is, is front and center of that, of that discussion. So yes, uh, and I, I, I'm pleased to know that the Healthy Caribbean Coalition is or will soon be an observer in the Codex Alimentarius Commission where you can actually be engaging and engaging Caribbean countries in shaping those regulations. Because before we talk about implementing regulations, let's, we are in a very globalized world. It's not that each country comes up with its own idea of what regulations should be, because that would cause huge disruptions in terms of moving food around, around the globe. So being engaged at global and regional levels in terms of determining appropriate regulation is key having the capacities to enforce, because having something on paper is one thing, being able to enforce it is something completely different. And here again, this is where, and I, I know in Barbados at the moment, there are discussions about strengthening and reorganizing agriculture, health and food safety systems. So the enforcement is, is, is important. So there nutrition regulations in terms of labeling, in terms of composition of certain foods for special dietary uses, whether they be infant foods or other kind of special foods. There are food safety regulations. We were speaking earlier about pesticide residues and pathogens. So there are all kinds of regulations that need to be enforced effectively to make sure that food is safe. But the bottom line around having a better quality of food available uh, or addressing the issue of food systems and strengthened food systems goes, goes beyond that. And it's to do with everything we've been saying before. I mean, one could argue that if you're importing between 80 to 90% of your food, this is a fundamental problem with your food system, okay? And addressing that requires all of the things that we've been speaking about. We need to be much more clear with ourselves about what we can produce, how we innovate. Now the link between innovation and regulation and, and, and legislation, I think is important that we understand because as we start to evolve the way that we produce food, we have to be aware that the governance of those innovations is important. So we have to be sure that our regulatory system keeps up with our innovation in production to make sure that all of the checks and balances are being met. So it's not 
about legislation that will fix the problem, but legislation and regulation are needed to support a system as it evolves and transforms. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just wonder if anyone had any follow-ups to what Dr. Clark talked about. I particularly liked her point about the support, the legislation needs to support the innovation basically, which also goes to uh, Pierre's point about how we need to have concrete commitment and what does that look like? And Dr. Clark gave us an example of what that looks like, stronger legislation. So I, at this point, we are at the official end, but the conversation has been so good. And I feel like we barely scratched the surface. I'm begging if Dr. Clark can spare us another 10 minutes. I feel like some people might wanna get in to some more questions. So if just 10 more minutes, and then we will uh, let uh, Dr. Clark go, cause I know she has a busy schedule. I'm enjoying this. So yes, you definitely can spend 10 more minutes. Ah, oh, perfect. See guys? <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, I am going to go back to Victoria. So we're going to keep it on a rotation. I know you had another question. This probably will be your last question. So I don't want to put any pressure, but make it your best question that you could think of at the moment. I feel like I went out the game strong with my best question. Now I'm <laughs> under pressure. Um, I just feel like, you know, and, and like I kept sort of saying that I was coming to this with sort of almost a small scale perspective because I just as a, as a person, I get so overwhelmed thinking about how big the food system is. Like I find it, it get, you know, almost anxiety inducing when I think about it on such a big scale when on a day to day, I'm just trying to troubleshoot with that person in front of me. How are we going to help you eat healthier in a way that you can afford? And that's that's realistic for you. So I feel like my questions tend to be on the smaller scale because the other question that I was thinking about was just, you know, locally, what are the opportunities for young people to kind of get exposure to what the farming uh, sort of industry is like in Barbados? Because like I said, I think my exposure to it was really minimal and it was always put across as that, you know, oh, maybe your school has a little front garden and it's sort of just a fun learning experience um, as opposed to seeing what it's like um, as a career, you know, um, so it was just sort of wondering if and what sort of the opportunities that might already exist that I don't know about are kind of locally for exposing young people to um, what opportunities lie, you know, in agriculture. That's a, that's a nice question, and I will answer as well as I can, although I'm sure there are lots of opportunities that I don't know about. I can tell you when I joined this office in 2019, this is pre-COVID, sounds like, you know, pre, we're in an, an era, pre-COVID, um, I visited an experimental farm. It was being run by an NGO, it, um, Think Design. And one of the, it was very interesting because they were playing around with using solar, solar panels to be growing under shade so farmers are basically producing electricity and producing food. It was really, it. so it was, a, an, and the most important thing connecting with your question is that they were dedicated to bringing youth in to experience this, this experimental production. So, you know, teaching them to keep their eyes open and, and, and imagine possible solutions and figure out what works best. So I was inspired by that. I think it's great. And I'm still hoping that FAO can, can find a way to support that and similar initiatives. We are, and we are doing, as I mentioned before, work around value chain assessment to be supporting um, farming groups or producing producer groups to be able to produce better for the market. But our starting point is usually people who have already identified agriculture. So they're, they're in producer groups or farmers groups already. But what you mentioned, and, and you know, several of you were, were speaking about, wouldn't it be great if there was a different treatment of agriculture in curricula? And this will be a process, I suppose, rather than, a, than in a moment, but it, it may be a small start, but I know we, one of the things that, uh, that our fisheries group here was trying to do is they were working on the integrated aquaculture aquaponics systems. And there was a, and it's, it's still ongoing, an effort to be putting some of these units in schools. 
so that you know the children can see that agriculture can be many things and that innovation is a part of it so this is part of the idea of introducing young people at a very early stage to a different notion of agriculture Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Um, considering the time crunch, I'm just going to go quickly on to Chris to see if he had one more question to ask you. Uh, Chris? Thank you, Megan. Um, since you're here and I know you love this kind of conversation, I just wanted to touch very briefly on the idea of inclusion and gender equity within the space um, of agriculture and sustainable farming. Um, I, we know that we have a strong example in St. Lucian of Helen's Daughters, um, who work specifically with encouraging females to step into the agricultural space. So what are there any measures or any kind of areas that you perceive, Dr. Clark, that um, younger persons, more women, persons with disabilities um, and or learning impairments, how can they become involved in this conversation and space and career pathway? Well, we do have ongoing programs jointly with UN Women with a focus on getting women and youth more engaged. So, it, it, so it's a question of uh, really targeting, you know, making sure that at least a certain proportion of our beneficiaries are indeed women. But I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but the bottom line is portraying the opportunities that agriculture presents. You know, it is not just backbreaking work that might not appeal to many. It can be many things. And as long as we are successful at demonstrating opportunity, and of course, vigilant to make sure that there are, there are no barriers to women getting in, we will find a lot more women and youth engaging. We need to create the opportunity. We need to show that it can work. Definitely. Um, and to that point, I think another issue that I've witnessed in my own experience here at FAO is that we present some opportunities, um, but sometimes a demographic doesn't really access that because there are unique challenges that prevent them from actually fully maximizing those opportunities. So it's one thing to present them, but also if you realize that a certain demographic, even though we say, hey, this is available, hey, do you know about this? Why are they not accessing? I think we still need to ask our question, the question, what is stopping them from fully, the barriers that you mentioned, why are we, are we not seeing an intake, an uptake of inclusivity, even though we have the best of intentions? So I just wanted to point, uh, make that particular point as well uh, to buttress yours, Dr. Clark. And now we're gonna move on to Pierre and see if he has one final question before we leave the room for final comments. So Pierre? Yeah, thank you again. Now, the other questions I have were uh, a, bit, a bit heavier, um, but to lighten up the space a bit, I think generally as, as a young person involved in these uh, conversations around empowering youth and providing them with the um, platforms and spaces and financial support to um, push messages and engage in um, real activism, um, I think my question would be uh, just what are those priority areas? I know we spoke about, you know, conversations around ugly foods and why that needs to be normalized. What are those priority areas that youth advocates and young persons can get involved in to help spread a message of um, better food systems or a better understanding of food systems so that I too can support the um, FAO objectives? Um, and SDG 12, I think it was mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, something comes to mind. I haven't had time to think it through, but I'll, I'll just throw it in there. You know, I, I, I've said already that we can't transform agriculture without doing things differently, transforming ourselves, our ways of thinking, our ways of doing and delivering. And, you know, there, I suppose I would like to see even driven by the youth, that insistence at the, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I can't remember who said it, maybe it was Megan or, or was, spoke about accountability, you know, we are accountable to you, we do want, 
We do want you to be driving us to do things differently. Us, not just FAO, but all of us working in agriculture, asking us questions. What are we doing to change? What are we doing to get better? Because there's a certain, as always, reluctance to change. I need that young people be driving, making sure that we don't lose energy along the way. There are a couple of innovations that in this office we've been focused on. And you know, I, I come when I speak about it, from some people I get a lot of energy. Wow, that's great. And from other people, I get, you know, oh, oh, well, well, you know, well, why? Why change? Or let me make it concrete. One of them relates to novel animal feeds. And animal feeds, we talk about increasing animal production and uh, replacing imports, our governments have given us a clear mandate, reduce imports by 25%. We're importing most of our animal feed. So when I start talking about novel animal feed, and we started this already in 2019, the first project was around fish silage, using waste from fish markets to make silage that can be a feed ingredient. The other one relates to insect rearing. You know, insects can change the protein content of waste foods, can upgrade the protein content, and it can be used as a feed ingredient. Great. Some, from some people, I get excitement. Okay, how can it work? What are the controls? Because there are controls for everything. Remember what I told you, regulation and good practice have to evolve as we change our production system. But from some other people, I hear, oh, I don't want my chickens eating worms. You know, and I wonder, well, what do you think your yard fowls are running around eating? You know, what, what do you think your pigs are eating? This reluctance to think about things differently. So if you ask, is there something that young people can do? Inquire and advocate and militate for the change that we need to see to transform agriculture. I do remember you raising that um, novel food feeds system in innovation. I do remember you mentioning that to me and I was like, oh, that's different. But I can <laughs> see the use and I can see why that is something that we need to start thinking about. What can we do differently? And as young people, it's kind of our role to be the change makers and to push for these types of innovation. So I'm sure you've given us a lot to think about today. I am going to wrap up because I know we're a little bit over time and you are, as I mentioned before, extremely busy. I think you mentioned this might have been like your fourth meeting for the day. So I'm really grateful that you were able to squeeze us in today to have this conversation. Um, you've given us some things to think about. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Victoria, Chris, our peer, are there any final comments just before we finally, finally wrap up? And no pressure. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> I, no? think, I think finally, I just, oh. sorry, I, I think finally, I just like to say um, that, that this type of conversation and these types of engagement need to continue. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. probably in, in a structured way that allows us to move from uh, conversation into ideation and implementation and the creation of real projects and programs by you, for you, that can help to see tangible change within our food systems. Um, I think that's where we need to move to next, moving into the implementation of certain things that we all know and would like to see, um, but we just need the support to put them in place and, and the um, resources in terms of human resources, ideas, minds, and, and thinking to actually execute these things so that we can have better food systems for all. Yeah. Thanks so much, Pierre. Um, I can definitely say that this will not be the last session for sure. Um, Dr. Clark has shown extreme enthusiasm for young people in this area. And I know the comms team listening is extremely excited and thought that this session was went extremely well. So I can safely say that this won't be the last session. And you're right, we do need to have these conversations and more of them, uh, perhaps in a more informal setting where we can actually get down to the nitty gritty and come up with an actual plan and strategy because this isn't a good first step, but you always need a conversation about how do we implement these ideas that we have. So I am going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you taking the time to participate. I knew I would not be disappointed because you each come with something completely different and just add value to the conversation. So 
Thank you for taking the time, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much. Uh, for those who have tuned in, thank you. Uh, it has always a pleasure to sit down and talk about young people in the agriculture, agri-food system. And with that, I am going to give an official sign off. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day, night, evening, whenever you're viewing this. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. Happy World Food Day. <laughs> Thank you.